So, welcome back to Third Age Reforged and to another battle replay. And today we have a free for all, and it is actually a themed free for all as well, because we're going to be seeing a great civil war between all of the Numenorean inheritor factions and Numenor themselves, to be fair. So, who is the strongest in terms of their Numenorean blood? We shall see. Um, and this is a rather interesting map as well. There are obviously these sort of the mountainous terrain over on this side of the map, which may very well sort of force the engagements down over here into more narrow terrain, which will be interesting. Whereas over here, over on this side of things, you can see it's a little bit more open. There's a few ruins. There's water as well separating the various segments of the map. There's also quite a lot of trees as well, which uh, all the teams involved are going to have to uh, be aware of, because all of the Numenorians have got a couple of units each, and in Arthur Dane's case, uh, quite a few units actually, which are capable of hiding. And of course, that only becomes more apparent when you have a lot of trees and a lot of heavily wooded terrain, such as that is on this map. But we'll start off over here in the more mountainous and hilly terrain. Um, with the player who actually sent me the battle replay, the players playing as Numenor themselves, trying to keep hold of their crown as uh, rulers of their blood, and that is going to be Sin of the Dark Cloud. So Numenor, of course, you know, of all of the factions on display today, are probably the most quality focused. Uh, the Numenorean factions in general do tend to have a little bit more of a skew towards that, with maybe Cardolan and arguably Gondor uh, being slightly lower down on that, with access to more... Uh, more sort of low tier militia units and able to field more numbers, but for the most part, all Numenorians are going to have access to similar things. Like they have, you know, good armor, you know, trebuchets, you know, mostly sort of powerful units that are capable of surviving quite a long time because of their armor, their shields, and their superior weapon smithing and that sort of thing. Numenor, of course, the ultimate example of that, going more into their quality than pretty much anything else, because even Umbar have got access to stuff like corsairs and. Arthur Dane, of course, have got access to their Evendim units, whereas Numenor, they really don't have anything like that. They have to go into at least mid-tier units on up to their stronger stuff, of course. Remena Caribrim as well. For their cavalry, Numenor do tend to have a little bit more of a focus around killing enemy cab units. They do have some, you know, units like the Caribrim here, Spear Cavalry, are very versatile. They can, of course, charge into infantry and do tons of damage to them. But, you know, the purpose behind Spear Cavalry is, of course, that they are multifaceted. They do trade in a little bit of their effectiveness at charging into uh, infantry blobs and doing a lot of damage that way in the way that Lance Cavalry does um, in favour of having that extra ability against uh, other cavalry units, which should be quite interesting and useful against the cavalry forces that are going to be on display against them, I would imagine. Over here, he's got some Narun Aru Sentinels combined with some Royal Legion of Armenelos guarding his back line, so perhaps feeling as though the faction that was deploying in the north here could swing around and get him while he was here in the mountains to the west, so just having these guys as a bit of a rear guard for now. Very good rear guard as well, I have to say. A lot of quality in there. Speaking of which, the Pharazim Nobles are also here, again another example of how strong Numenor can be in a cavalry to cavalry engagement, because of course they are melee cavalry, melee knights in fact. Again, you know, the distinction with these guys is that they are a little bit they do trade in a little bit of their effectiveness against other cavalry in favour of having a slightly better charge than other melee knights, so again there is a bit of a contradiction there, but for the most part you can think of them as melee knights that may not be able to hit the heights that something like the Witch Realm Inquisitors will, but they do have a little bit more effectiveness against charging into infantry, so they're a little bit more versatile at the cost of their a little bit of their strength up front, but for the most part you use them in exactly the same way. I do not have shadow bows. <laughs> Oh, excuse me, I think I'm getting a bit of a blocked nose. Hopefully it's not that plague that's going around. Um, but yeah, the Adunaim Shadow Bows are here, and of course, in a, a bit of narrow terrain like this, if you bring rangers, if the engagement is favourable to you, you can really start to shred your way through the enemy army. We'll see if the Adunaim Shadow Bows are able to do that. Regardless, the Adunaim Shadow Bows actually have some pretty decent armour values. For the most part, a ranger's weakness is generally the fact that they're lightly armoured um, and can easily be skirmished with. That's not really the case with the Adunaim Shadow Bows. They have, I think, 10 armour? Which is very, very good, you know, at, at least it's higher than, it might not be 10 actually, but it is higher than you would expect from a ranger unit, which means they're a little bit more well suited for skirmishing like that. Of course, Mordor have got access to these guys as well, so uh, something they can use. Remena Boabrim as well, this is another unit which of course very heavily armoured that Numenorean plate. Armour piercing arrows, not a lot of ammunition though, so you do need to pick and choose your targets carefully. So we'll see how well the ammunition for this unit is used, of course, because you can't really skirmish with them because, for one, it's a horrible misuse of their very limited ammunition, um, and also they don't have enough ammunition to sustain that uh, engagement for very long, so it's uh, not really worth it on two fronts. But there are two units of them, and then the main force in here, we've got some Remena Abarim hidden, the Pharazim Swordmasters, which are real monsters. Like, overall, them and the Noldorim Blade Masters, I think, are indisputably the strongest unit of heavy swordsmen in the game because I believe they are actually stronger than the Temple Executioners by a notable extent so uh, 
definitely mixing it up with Linden for the best heavy swordsman in the game here in Uvenor. Seafarers of Pindamos, brilliant supporting unit with their javelin fire, very limited ammunition supply though as well, so you do have to be careful from, uh, from that perspective, but also they double as decent makeshift line infantry, which can be important to add more numbers to what is often a rather small Numenor army because of their quality and expense. Remen and Ardukadar, of course, as well. Armor-piercing spear is a really, really effective unit because they combine that uh, ability against cavalry with the armor-piercing, which means they can act as pretty do exactly the same sort of job as line infantry do against heavily armored factions, which is a very big thing, of course. In addition to, of course, being you know having good stats because of their uh, their cost. More seafarers of Nindamo, so I'm not too surprised to see Sin invest quite heavily in them. But of course, in this narrow pass as well, especially if whoever he's facing off against comes forward really aggressively into this narrow pass. Javelins, range of fire, and armor piercing arrows will do so much damage to them on the approach that even the smaller army in terms of infantry strength that Numenor has will still probably be able to clear them up. Speaking of which, let's go through the southern army now, and it is going to be Cardolan played by the Ventral one. So Cardolan of all the Numenorian factions, definitely the most um, numbers focused of them all, I would suggest. Um, and also the blood is probably most diluted here. So the pure Numenorian blood going up against the mud bloods that are Cardolan, I suppose. Royal Court of House the Rondor, very heavily armoured, very effective multiple HP lance as well. Quite similar in many ways to something like the Dragon's Wrath Warlords from Rune, or maybe even the uh, Mithrandir's Retinue from Gondor. Probably a little bit more in common with Rune though, obviously the heavier armour. Quite slow as well in comparison to the faster lances that some other factions have, like the Black Serpents from Harad. One thing Cardan will have to be on the lookout for here, especially with some Dunedain Commanders and Tharbad Riders, again pretty similar. Um, situation here with pretty swift lances, very devastating off the charge. Um, not the best armor scores, but as they are Dunedain, they are a little bit more able to look after themselves in melee with other cavalry. It's not ideal, but they can do it. Um, and also the Tharbad Riders, which have got a really high charge for the cost, but also they have a few downsides to that as well. Like, you know, they do have the low morale that Cardlan suffers from, so you do often see the Tharbad Riders bite off a little bit more than they can chew, charge into a situation, do a lot of damage, but then almost immediately rout. Um, so they're quite difficult to use per, like profit properly, but if you can, very damaging. The one problem Cardland might have in this situation, considering the three other factions on the field, is they really don't want to be in melee with other other cavalry forces for any length of time. Really, they need to use their cavalry. They need to keep their cavalry moving. Um, if they can get charges off, though, you know they're going to be able to do a lot of proportional damage to the smaller armies they'll be facing off against, um, and then their larger armies could be able to just envelop them as they come forward. Greenway Garrison Archers will also give them a good unit to just skirmish with the enemy for with for an extended period of time, of course. They're not going to win many skirmish fights, um, but they're so cheap and obviously there's so many of them that they can definitely waste an opponent's ammo supply. Um, and yeah, That's, that's going to be what they do here. A lot of Greenway Garrison Archers. Speaking of which, there's the combination of Greenway Garrison Spearmen and Footmen. So again, a very classic Cardland frontline this. Not a huge amount of expense on the very basic Militia Spears and the lower end Pikemen. But it's very difficult to break down from the front if you don't smash it to bits quickly with brute strength or if you don't try and circumvent it somehow. Um, so it does force your opponent to think a little bit more about how they engage you because all Cardolan want to do is hold you in place for a long period of time for their damage dealers, which are their lancers, and these guys back here, their crossbows, to do most of the heavy lifting for them. In the Minheriath sharpshooters, the crossbows in general, are something that Cardolan are going to have an advantage over most other Numenorean factions. Umbar have some, but even then, Umbar's crossbows are not up to the same level as Cardlan's. Cardlan's really mix it up there with the very best and the likes of Erebor when it comes to them. I've, all, I've always been a little bit critical about crossbows in 0.97 because, particularly with a unit like this, the Minheria sharpshooters, because you can't really skirmish with them too efficiently because they're heavily armored and shielded. As soon as they get into range, they're going to start laying waste to enemy units with their bolts. The one thing I would say though is this is actually the sort of situation where armor piercing archers in the Boabra would probably be a good idea to actually shoot into the sharpshooters. Um, and they would be able to do a pretty decent amount of damage quickly. And it'll be interesting to see how the ventral one decides to tangle with the very good skirmish lines of the other Numenorean factions with their crossbows. We've got some Minheriath spearmen as well, so basic spears. They do actually have a bit of AP, interestingly enough, which is quite rare for a unit of this type. It kind of offsets their lower morale a little bit. Um, but for the most part, their AP isn't going to be enough to make them stand up to something like the Remen and Ardukadar or a Baron. It's just something that will make them a little bit more dangerous in this sort of situation. So actually a pretty good pick. Speaking of AP, we also have some Mercenary Guildsmen. In a situation where you know you're going to be facing off against the other Numenorean factions, investing a little bit more into Cardland's AP is going to be a good idea, because obviously the Numenoreans, all of them, uh, are a little bit more bought into the whole heavy plate armour thing. 
and the mercenary guildsmen with their maces can crack through that to some extent. As of course can the Tharbad Warhammers, potentially one of the most dangerous units of infantry that's going to be on the field today actually. You know, that armour piercing is going to be really really useful as long as they're supported properly because of course there aren't very many of them. But surrounded by all of the card and numbers that they are, should be a, should be a, an interesting proposition. Dunedain Captains as well, Heavy Swordsmen, obviously not on the level of the, of the Pharisim Sword Masters, but they do fill the same role for Cardlin in that they are very high quality, high base damage, high defence, all the sort of things you expect from them. Spearmen back here, we also have the Minheriath Archers, so again the heavier archers, they'll be able to, they're obviously in terms of quality much better than the Greenway Garrison Archers out front. Um, interesting that they're in the second line, it'll be interesting to see how they are used, but certainly Cardlin has all the tools here to be in an elongated skirmish fight and draw the battle out for a longer period of time if need be um, as long as they are careful and then at the back Menatar Romain gatekeepers to round off their complete crossbow line they don't have the armor upgrade but halberdiers in melee very effective crossbowmen at range you very rarely see cardinal go without the gatekeepers then the easternmost faction we have umbar played by inarius so it'll be interesting to see how they built their army normally umbar go a little bit more quality heavy and it does look as though they have done so here balaketh marksman with the armor upgrade as well, a fantastic archer to skirmish with. Obviously, you do spend a little bit more when you invest in a heavy archer like this to win the skirmish line, but it is a very difficult unit to overcome. It's the sort of thing that certainly wouldn't be out of place in a faction like Dale, who of course pride themselves on winning any skirmish fight they enter through sheer uh, sheer power, obviously their survivability and their defensive attributes, as opposed to some a faction like the Elves, who usually go for a little bit more damage and killing potential. Uh, but yeah, Balaketh Marksman on the front, very good choice. Uh, we have some Belagar pikemen in behind, you know, obviously pikes. Nice, efficient front line here as well. They are a little bit better overall in terms of their stats than something like the Greenway Garrison Footmen. Um, but it's, it is also worth saying as well that Umbar do tend to have smaller armies, so it'll be a little bit more difficult for them to just blanket a front line with uh, long pointy sticks and uh, sort of hold for an elongated period of time, at least passively. A Dunaim Shield Guard over on this side, so heavy Numenorean spears this. Pretty expensive for what they offer, to be fair. You know, they, you do spend quite a lot for a unit of this quality. They don't have AP, like something like the Ramedan Nardukadar, but overall, when you have a spear of this quality, they can still hold their own in melee against basic infantry, and of course, they're really, really deadly to cavalry, and sitting them in the middle of the line as well, they are locked morale. Also, Umbar's morale in general, in stark contrast to Cardlin's, is very good, generally because they have to bring sort of higher quality armies, but even so. A lot of Alcarondas Legion as well, obviously Umbar, one of the things that they really have in their favour is you know, a lot of heavy infantry power, much in the same way that Numenor themselves have. In many ways, I actually think of all of the all the Numenorean factions, other than Numenor themselves, the one that the one that does bear most in common with them is probably Umbar, to be fair. Um, and obviously, uh, Castamir will be very pleased with that assessment. Um, but Alcarondas Legion is going to be quite difficult for Arthur Dane across the way, I think, uh, to match up with that quality for quality. Uh, we have the Harbingers of Castamere and the Naranaru Sentinels. So the Sentinels, of course, are a unit that they share in common with Numenor themselves. And the Harbingers of Castamere as well, another heavy swordsman. They may be a bit of a pale imitation of the Pharisim Swordmasters in terms of overall uh, standard of unit, but they're still a very strong heavy swordsman, to be fair to them. Um, and it's going to be difficult, again, to match up with them one-to-one. -one. Arthurdain across the way here. Going to have to approach this battle in a bit of a different way, I think, because... Oh, excuse me. While they do have... Some pretty good infantry for the most part. It isn't going to be on, to the, on the same level as Umbar if they invest heavily as Inarius has done. So Death Eater here, he's gone for some Arthurdain Marksmen. Unupgraded on the front, they're cheaper than the Balaketh Marksmen across the way, but this also means that they should lose fairly handily in that skirmish fight. In the middle of his army, he's got some Fornos Array Knights, and this is where I think Arthurdain can lay down a big advantage over a faction like Umbar, and it is in their cavalry. Arthur Dane of all the Numenorean factions actually have got a really wide array of cavalry which they can use to their advantage, especially in a situation like this where Umbar has not brought any. Umbar, of, oh, actually they have Alcarondas Faithful and Warlords of Umbar. I nearly missed those because those are two very uh, substantial units. Obviously melee knights over here are really, really strong. They've got the, uh, the, the nice Numenorean helmets as well, really nice design on them. Uh, very good melee knights, but they do have a smaller unit count. And of course the Warlords of Umbar, which are Lance Knights. But that is big expense on those two units. And Arthurdain can match up with that reasonably well. And also add numbers on top of that. So with units like Fornos to Rain Knights over here. And the Cavalry back over here. We've got some Dunedain Scouts. Of course Horse Archers, which could be really useful. Knights of Venuminous, which in terms of Lance Knights are really, really tough to kill. Uh, they want to stay clear of the Alcarondas Faithful if they can though. And then over on the other side. We have the other really high tier unit in the Royal Court of House Armlaith, so multiple HP lances as well. 
Four Nostra Rain Knights, and I think those are Dunedain Peacekeepers, indeed they are on the front line here, so really high damage units over here. So this is where sort of Arthedain's infantry quality does come from. They can't blanket their line in quite the same way as Umbar can with Alcarondas, Faithful, and all the Balakath units can, generally speaking, but these are units that will stand up, and in the middle, they've gone for much more of the Cardlan approach here, uh, where they've gone for their basic spears and their pikes, so they'll be hoping to hold the Umbar infantry quality at bay for an extended period of time, and then utilize their cavalry to its fullest effect to try and do the damage and maybe squeeze in from the sides with the dismounted knights and the peacekeepers there could be hidden units as well of course back in the trees there's probably rangers to be fair there could also be gray company hidden around here somewhere but without further ado let's begin um, we may as well stay over here because certainly i think the first battle to get underway will be the fight between arthurdain and umbar they are directly facing off with one another straight from the off whereas numenor and cardlan Cardlan has sort of deployed more generically, whereas Numenor has definitely taken shelter within the mountains on the western side of this map. Dunedain Troll Slayers as well. Another decent choice, this, as long as they can get into range without being picked apart by the Umbar Archers, because their javelins are so deadly, of course. And then in melee as well, when they pull out those axes, multiple HP, shock infantry, basically. And that AP is going to be useful against most of Umbar's forces, to be fair. In fact, all of it, to be honest. Balaketh marks and firing away. It is worth saying that, you know, with those two units of knights, to be fair, there probably isn't a great deal of hidden units around here for Umbar. They've got a very quality heavy, which means their army's going to be smaller. There could be the odd hidden unit, though. There could be maybe a unit of Corsair crossbowmen tucked away somewhere. Possibly Castamere's Rangers. Difficult to tell, certainly. But you can see over here that the Arthur Day marksman opening up on the Balaketh Marksman and the two sets of archers are going to be firing into one another. You can see as Umbar returns fire, to be fair, even without the armor upgrades, the Arthur Day Marksman, this is the sort of fight that they, you know, they are built for, essentially. Heavy male armor will do its best to absorb the arrow fire they're coming under. Uh, but you can see over here that the, the death toll over on the Umbar side of the battlefield is still smaller for the time being, but Fornos to Rain Knights charging forwards. The Adunine Shield Guard are going to come forward to try and cut that charge off. They're just going to miss. Uh, but those archers are going to be able to get away. The first group of archers is going to get away. But Inarius, unfortunately for him, he's a little bit slow on the uptake to retreat his second one. Maybe hoping that the cavalry would retreat. This is a bold charge, though, because they are going to charge in. They're going to clip the back end of those archers. But that's not really a worthwhile trade when you're also clipping off against the uh, Balagai pikemen as well. So uh, it's not the sort of thing which um, Arthurdain can afford too much more of, to be honest with you, because Arthurdain, you know, one thing that they can certainly count on here is their cavalry. They've got their horse archers doing their thing as well. In come the Adunine Shield Guard. Death Eater's trying to move in. He's trying to be aggressive here, which is interesting. I think maybe he sees that with the archer quality that is arrayed against him, the, Bal the Balaketh Marksman will probably just be able to continue to go about their business for an elongated period of time. So he's trying to seize the initiative here. Unfortunately, though, his pikes were caught out by a bit of a charge from the Adunaim Shield Guard. But with the support of the Avondim Spearmen coming in, with the Phalanx now being lowered, uh, these uh, heavy Numenorean Spearmen have maybe gone a little bit too far forward for any sort of support. For Nostarain Knights, they do manage to charge into the Balaketh Marksman. And actually, I think at this point, it's time for a bit of half speed. Those Balaketh Marksmen, the Adunaim Shield Guard, are here, but they're having to try and defend this unit of archers from multiple angles as the Grey Company fire. So, yes, there are body piercing arrows slicing through the umbar line they've got themselves into a good position as well from death to this he's going to try and shoot right up the line here which that is going to be a great equalizer here to deal with that superior umbar quality that's going to be on the front line in addition of course to all the pikes and from a pike perspective arthur Dane have the advantage with a unit like the illuminous gate guards to be honest and also the belagaya pikemen have not even moved forward to engage yet a big charge coming in there from the royal court of house armley Multiple HP Lance, of course, very good stats all around. Getting a good hit there on the Balaketh Marksman. Interestingly enough, just having a look over here. Cardland were on their way over here. I think they were going to try and swing around maybe over that way, but that's a long way to march, and I felt I feel as though maybe they thought uh, that Numenor would be able to catch up to them from behind. But they have also... You know, one of the things that they would really have wanted to do, of course, would be to try and coax Numenor out onto more open terrain, because going into that canyon against Numenor's quality was always going to be suicidal. So Cardland doing the right thing there by not... Know, charging forward in a situation where they were obviously going to lose. Evendim Spearmen and the Arthane Pikemen doing a good job on the front line, but unless Arthurdane can keep up the cavalry pressure and continue to fire in with their Grey Company, eventually Umbar's quality should be quite telling. You can see over here, over on this side as well, looking like there's been 
a pretty big massacre over here. That's a lot of uh, a lot of dead Dunedain and a lot of dead Warlords of Umbar as well. There's only eight Warlords of Umbar remaining, 16 Alcarondas faithful, so they've definitely taken a bit of a beating as well. The Knights of Anuminus as well, so Battle of the Titans going on over here, but I think unfortunately for them also the Wardens of the North have been firing in. So the Knights of Anuminus sacrificing themselves essentially, charging in, blobbing up the Umbar Knights in one location and then allowing the armor-piercing arrows of the Wardens of the North and the standard arrows actually from the Arthday Marksmen to come in and uh, do a lot of damage. Wounds of the North do take a bit of a charge there, which will do a bit of damage to them. But if the uh, Umbar Knights stay in melee too long, they will find that the Wounds of the North can certainly bite back in melee as well. Those big long swords that they wield, very, very accomplished with them as well. They're effectively, you know, a bodyguard tier heavy swordsman in melee as well. A very multifaceted unit indeed, the Wardens of the North. Over here, meanwhile, sort of charging forward with the Odunai Shield Guard, they did manage to, to catch that unit of pikes off balance, but very quickly they found themselves isolated and surrounded on all sides, and the dismounted four Nostra Raid Knights coming in now. The good thing about this from an Umbar perspective, though, is the fact that they will stand and fight to the bitter end, they won't break. And they do have Castamere's Rangers and Corsair Crossbowmen, so they actually have more hidden units than I thought they would, but the Royal Courthouse Arm Lathe are charging in here, making it difficult for the crossbows to do their thing. And with the Knights of Anubinus gone, they do now represent the biggest cavalry threat that Arthurdain still have remaining to them. Down here as well, it must be said that you know while Arthurdain are still managing to filter in behind the lines with units like Dunedain Peacekeepers, they're not making the same sort of ground as they are on the other side, I don't think. Dunedain Peacekeepers charging through the Balakith Marksmen, but between the Marksmen and these Adunaim Shield Guard, I think the, the Peacekeepers are a little bit too far behind enemy lines for this to be too successful from their perspective. But we shall see. Dunai Shield Guard coming in there, but also Alcarondas Legion. So Umbar trying to push back as well. Um, and the Alcarondas Legion giving as good as they get here. A little bit stretched, I think, over on this side, Arthur Dane. So it is interesting, this, because I feel as though if Arthur Dane are able to do the right things, and this is going to be a big charge coming in from the back from the Royal Court House Armlath. If Arthur Dane is able to keep being active like this and keep pressuring Umbar with their cavalry and with their ranged units. Arthurdain should win this fight because this fight so far has gone pretty well for them but if they let up for even a moment Umbar's quality could be enough to drag themselves back into this battle but I will say that it is looking pretty good for Arthurdain as it stands. Harbingers of Castamere also being overwhelmed really in terms of sheer numbers. Alcarondas Faithful are going to try and charge in here but I feel as though this is almost a move where the Umbar player I think they're panicking a little bit. I think they see their front line being overrun. They see themselves taking massive damage from the Grey Company from the Royal Court of House Armlade, and they're trying to do the same thing to them, but 10 melee knights charging into a cluster of lower end spears and pikes is not going to have the same sort of impact as hitting the centre mass at the front line with the Royal Court of House Armlade was going to do. Royal, the mounted Four Nostra Raid knights charging in here to try and help out the Dunedain Peacekeepers that are still fighting hard, axes out. But it is a bold move to charge in here where there are a Dunaim shield guard, but they were actually able to rout off the remnants of that Balakath marksman unit, so it wasn't completely without merit. But the Adunaim shield guard, of course, like I said, locked morale, they'll stay there. The Grey Company have been in an ideal position all this time, and unfortunately for Umbar, they just haven't had the tools to go out there and stop them. Like, they have been out there, they've been sort of free to do as they will, basically, um, and that's never a good sign. If you're sort of allowing a unit of rangers, mounted or no, to shoot right up your front line, then you're probably going to end up losing that fight, regardless of who it is. Dunedain Troll Slayers have also been throwing their javelins in, so I think so far it's been an excellently played battle by Arthur Dane, I would have to say, and it's the merits of being aggressive, once again, showing through. If they'd have sat back, their Arthur Dane marksmen would have ultimately lost the fight against the Balaketh marksmen, they wouldn't have really gained a great deal. And Umbar would have been feeling good going into what would have been the infantry fight as it then would have been. But um, as it is, Arthur Dane seized the initiative and Umbar have never been able to take it back for themselves. Four Nostra Rain Knights charging in once again, again, sort of really clipping the wings of this Umbar skirmish line. To be fair, but with Rangers, crossbows, two units of Balakath marksmen, Umbar had all the range tools they needed to make Arthur Dane bleed pretty heavily. But in the end, Arthur Dane have used their tools better. And I think this is one of the main reasons for it. Like this Grey Company, like we haven't been able to keep track of all the arrows flying through the air up until this point. 
but they've been allowed to sit out here on the side because Umbar, you know, their cavalry was drawn into a fight with those Knights of Anumnus early on. The Warns of the North and the Arthurday Marksmen did severe damage to them, and Umbar, because of how quality heavy they went with their cavalry, which they have to, of course, uh, they don't really have a great deal of options, Umbar, on horseback. What they do have is very strong, but very limited in number. And Arthurdain have made their numerically superior cavalry really work for them here. Harbingers of Casimir, though, 43 of them. They are starting to take a toll on this section of the Umbar line. But between the pikes and the Arthurdain heavy swordsmen and Dunedain that are over here, even if they are bled heavily by uh, Castamir's most faithful servants, I really don't feel as though it's going to be enough to deal with them. There's also the troll slayers, which could uh, turn their attention on them with their axes. But yeah, so far, so very good for Arthur Day. I feel as though Umbar, what they wanted was a nice long fight where their quality could just grind Arthur Day down. Uh, but in the end, in the end, it hasn't worked out that way. Arthur Day took the fight to Umbar. And they were, and finally the Grey Company is being chased off by the Shield Guard, but too late for Umbar, I think. Maybe Umbar would have benefited from something like the Balakith Axe Guard. That would have been a nice amount of AP for Axemen of that type as well. They've got a decent amount of melee defense. The AP would have been very useful against quite a lot of these units, to be honest. If they were going to go for a more defensive setup like this, they needed to have equal cover on both sides, maybe a couple of units of, cro like both their units of crossbows, one on this side, one on this side to maybe try and zone out the cavalry. Um, as it was, you know, still the Royal Court House Arm Lake are charging in and they have definitely been, so far, the MVPs for Arthur Dane. They have done some absolutely devastating charges. The, normally it's the Knights of Anuminus that get uh, top billing, but today the Knights of Anuminus were used more as bait for the Umbar cavalry and uh, it's the Royal Court House Arm Lake's time to shine. About time went up to one speed once again, and another just in time to see another full blooded charge from the four Noster Rain Knights. Which basic lances like this, to be fair, you don't often see them do this well because normally people are adept enough at the game that they can, you know, people are sort of used to dealing with cavalry to the extent that with how fragile lances can be, you see them die off quite quickly. And even here, you know, you can see they're starting to fall. Um, but to be fair, Umbar. As soon, it's almost like a turtle getting flipped on its back here. As soon as Umbar was put into this situation, Arthur Dane's been free to do as they will with their cavalry. And to be fair, that's what Arthur Dane do need to do. You know, their skirmish line isn't... You know, you have more variety to choose from than Umbar overall, but ultimately, in terms of relative strengths, both sets of archers and ancillary skirmishes like javelins and crossbows and the like are relatively similar. Whereas, you know, obviously Umbar have got a big advantage in terms of their infantry. You know, they've just got more quality. So the one thing that Arthur Dane can bring to bear over Umbar is cavalry, especially in terms of their numbers. And that has been the main difference here. So it's neat to see Arthur Dane taking their biggest strength over their current opponent and sort of really hammering it home. Between two good players as well. It's not as if, you know, Inarius is no mug. He knows what he's doing. So this has just been sort of a good composition build, I think, and also good use of that from Death Eater. Still some uh, Anuminous Gate Guards as well. I mean, to be fair, the initial Arthur Dane line made up of Evandim Spears and Pikes, like, looking a little bit ragged at this point. And that does go to show, you know, Umbar, their army was, you know, it did have a decent amount of quality to it. There goes Castamere, skewered by a Pike. But it did have a decent amount of quality to it, and that alone will be enough to bleed your opponent unless, you know, you make absolutely horrendous mistakes. As long as you set up your army in a decent formation, then, you know, and you're sensible with how you use it, then even if you lose, you're going to be able to do a lot of damage to your opponent, which may ultimately end up being a big deciding factor in this, because, of course, as good as Arthur Dane's victory over here has been, as well as Death Eater has played so far, he may ultimately end up losing the battle because we still have to uh, sort out who's going to win between uh, Numenor and Cardolan over on the other side. So I think it is going to be two 1v1s culminating in a final 1v1. I think that's the sort of free fall we're going to see here. Unless Arthur Dane surprises me again by being very aggressive and moving forward to try and uh, catch one of the others unawares. Arthur Dane can in many ways sort of sit back and if one team looks like they're going to try and pull away with the victory over on the other side, they can then come swooping in to help one of their beleaguered foes. 
that's where the politics of a free-for-all starts to come in, and it'll be interesting to see how that plays out in the later stages of the fight, but certainly a good victory here for Martha Dane. They do still have some good units. They've got some wounds in the north. They still have a decent amount of Dunedain left. I say decent. Actually, to be fair, I think the Dunedain and the uh, dismounted Fornost Array Knights probably did take the brunt of the damage on both sides. They do actually still have a decent amount of pikes and Avenim spears, to be fair. Um, so, mostly their sort of basic units still alive. They do still have some higher quality units like the Dunedain Troll Slayers, Wardens of the North as well. Um, Arthur Dane Marksman, who probably still have ammo at least a bit. Their cavalry is still alive as well. So, I mean, you know, a damaged Arthur Dane army, but still a noticeably victorious one, to say the least. So, Death Eater will be feeling very pleased after that, and he's now going to move into the middle. Probably set himself up over here sort of admiring the view from this side and then if one side looks as though they're gaining the upper hand too much he can come in to uh, slap them back down if needs be. That would be ideal from his perspective but the Remena Caribrim are up there and they're hiding as well so that could also come into play but we shall see but certainly over here Sin definitely trying to use the map to his advantage sort of backing himself up to a choke point and this is interesting because as long as he stays here if things start to look a little bit dicey out on the more open terrain, he can pull back within the choke point. Um, and that will, uh, of course, allow him to really wall up. And even then, his smaller but more quality-focused army will then have a a whale of a time in this choke point. But I highly doubt the Cardland player is going to just allow him to do that. If I were the Cardland player, I probably would just send my archers forward. Try and play the long game here. Try and send forward my uh, my really lower end skirmishes first and foremost, because you're not going to do a ton of damage to Numenor. But Numenor can't really respond to that with their army composition here. They could, you know, the only thing that would be able to shoot back at them are the rangers and the armor piercing archers, which Sin will be loath to use on Greenway Garrison archers, even Minhiriath archers, to be fair. So you could use all four of your archer units to wear Numenor down a little bit. As for the units I'd want to go after. Probably the Seafarers, honestly. Most of this Numenorean line, after all, like the Romani units, are heavily armoured and shielded from the front. Yes, they're better overall in melee, but the amount of damage you're going to do is negligible. The Seafarers are shielded, but their armour and shields are both not as strong as the Romana that are around them. And also their Javelins. Like, the DPS on their Javelins is extreme. Numenor starts to move forward now, so Sin may be pleased with how much Cardinal has now moved in. He's drawn them in. And now he's going to try and strike, so Sin. Switching from defense to attack very, very quickly here. And of course, I think that one of the things he could do here is if he is able to kill off Cardinal quickly, Arthur is still a long way off. So, for Cardinal and, well, for Numenor and Cardinal, I would say, you know, if they can sort this battle out before Arthur Dane even becomes a factor, that would be preferable for both of them. But it's just a matter of who can uh, make this aggression pay most of all. For Cardlan, I think it's a similar story as on the other side. Like, Cardlan need to do what Arthurdane did on the other side, where they need to use their supporting units, like their cavalry and their archers, to good effect. Otherwise, the quality that Numenor have at their disposal would be far too much for the basic Cardlan units in uh, in a fight like this. Romen and Arduk are shaken, though. It's not often you see the Romen are shaken, but I think that was because of the damage they were taking. There are probably crossbow bolts heading into them as well. Dunedain commanders swinging out wide. Romen and Arduk are Sending forward, yeah, these are Minhiri, our sharpshooters, are getting full frontal volleys into the Romana and Arducadar there. But these crossbows, they are going to be caught ultimately. Getting a little bit too greedy there, trying to go for more than uh, more than one volley. And as a result, it's now going to be on the vengeful one to try and reposition his formation. Because now, at this point, Numenor are looking pretty good, honestly. Because they've managed to sort of force Card you know, their flanks, Cardland's flanks are not looking too good to support. I mean, over here it's a little bit better. The crossbows, if they just moved a little bit further in, they would have a perfect shot right down the line, which would do tons of damage then. Uh, but over here, Numenor are starting to overrun the Cardinal defences a little bit. There are a lot of arrows coming in, but you've got to remember a lot of these arrows are just very basic. As long as it's not the crossbow bolts that are hitting them, these Numenorean units will be quite happy with how things are going. And Numenor then will be able to come in with their own ranged units. And the support from the Seafarers, as well as the Rangers and the armor-piercing arrows, are going to be absolutely vital here. The one thing Sin will need to do here, I think, though, is to utilise a lot of his resources to beat Cardlin here with the tactic he's chosen. He's not going to be able to conserve too much for Arthur Dane. He's going to need to just fight the opponent that's in front of him first and foremost. And let's not forget as well that Cardlin have been able to get round the back with their Tharbads. 
Pharaohs and nobles are going to be uh, doing their best to chase off the Dunedain commanders, and they will succeed. But these Tharbad riders, they've got an absolutely lethal charge, like I said. So they are going to connect quite nicely here with the Boabarim. Doing some good damage there. But the Tharbad riders, good eventual one doing well there, sort of getting in and then getting out quickly. That's absolutely vital to Carlin's cavalry. Like, they really aren't designed for any sort of sustained combat. They charge in, do their damage, back out, and then rinse and repeat. In come the Tharbad Warhammers. Their presence on the front line is going to be absolutely necessary. For the time being, though, Cardlan actually winning the front line engagement. The quality of Numenor. Over here on this side, Numenor are winning. They're pushing Cardlan back, and then they could potentially wrap up the line. But the support, actually, from uh, from Cardlan is interesting. Cardlan winning sort of over here. Ooh, really nice charge, actually, in the back there from the Tharbad, uh, Tharbad Riders. Uh, that could be a huge moment in the fight, because, of course... Proportionally speaking, the numbers that Numenor have brought, if they take massive damage like that too often, their army's going to fall apart far quicker than Cardolans will with their numbers. Seafarers doing their best. I mean, Numenor over here, they're pushing in, putting a lot of pressure onto Cardolans flanks, but Cardolan, they have their cavalry over here as well. They should be able to charge in and do some damage. They want to avoid the Sentinels if they can, but here come the Pharisim nobles and the Karibarim. Oh, those are Dunaim Shadow Bows. Definitely taken a lot of damage from something before Arthur Dane ever showed up, but Arthur Dane is going to finish them off now. Not wanting to uh, have to tangle with any rangers with any ammunition in the late game. But Wavrin coming in, it's a really interesting fight actually between Cardlan and Numenor. Numenor are going to win down over on this flank. Cardlan are going to win up on the other flank, but I think Cardlan, they've got their crossbows into, an, into a position now where it's going to be... Uh, it's going to be pretty devastating, I think, for Numenor. Like the Royal Legion and the Pharisim Swordmasters on the front line are going to be very difficult to bring down for all of these basic Cardland units, but there's so many units that Cardland still have alive. There's AP in there from the Mace Men as well. Tharbad Warhammers trying to sort of paper over the cracks over on this side, and Cardland is still holding on over here, if only just. Uh, in the back lines, oof, hang on a minute, I think we need to go back down to half speed because it's all happening all at once over here. Numenor are in the back line, they're trying to do their best to shut down the Cardlan archers and crossbows that are still back here, but the Menatar Roman gatekeepers are difficult to shut down like this because of course they're halberdiers in melee, which means they're very good against cavalry in melee. You can still do good damage to them off the charge because normally they've got their crossbows out and they're not braced for a charge like that. But you can see, yeah, the Karibrim routing. AP, really high anti-cavalry bonus, not too surprising. Royal Corp House, the Rondor are there. Greenway Garrison archers are routing off though. A lot of Greenway Garrison Archers routing off. So the cavalry charges have had some effect back here. But the Pharisim Nobles, the only thing left. And they're looking fairly depleted at this point. So it's interesting, this. What do Arthur Dane do? Because I wouldn't say that either side is looking too dominant at this point. Although I would suggest that Cardlan, if things stay as they are, Cardlan will go on to defeat Numenor here. It's whether Arthur Dane believes that Numenor can inflict enough damage on Cardlan that what's left of their army will be sufficient to defeat what's left of Cardlan's. That would be my thinking here. And honestly, if I were Arthur Dane, I would just sit back and do nothing for the time being. Because I feel as though even if Numenor, you know, Numenor are in a pretty dicey situation here, like their frontline troops might be enough to help them fight their way out of it. But ultimately, even if it's not, stuff like the Pharisim Swordmasters and the Royal Legion will still be able to take their toll on what's left of the Cardlan army. And, uh, and do some damage. And what is Arthur Dane going to do here? The Grey Company are charging in. Interestingly enough, I think they're charging in on the Seafarers, which, uh, I mean, every charge that Arthur Dane makes as they charge in here, even if it's just with horse archers, is going to help Cardlan out. Tharbad Warhammer's victory, almost a certainty. So yeah, but the, the arrival of the Tharbad Warhammer's over here definitely helps stabilise the situation somewhat, but... Big route here from the Minhiri Spearmen and the Mercenary Guildsmen, that classic, shaky Cardlan morale coming into play once again. And as a result, the Tharbad Warhammers will be a little bit isolated against Ramena Abarim and the Seafarers. I think that was actually the charge of the Arthdane Cavalry, doing more damage to Cardlan's hopes, actually, than Numenor's, weirdly enough. Here in the back line. Still the Royal Court House Throndor, still with healthy numbers as well. Probably the single strongest cavalry unit still on the field in terms of all-round potential. I'm not sure where the Pharisim Nobles have gone. I think they're over there. Yes, they are. 
I saw the Naran Aru Sentinels, and that's interesting. I think Sin, he's just peeling off a couple of his units, trying to send them far away from the fight, make it look as though they're routing, when in reality he's trying to save something for the end. Because I think he realises here that this fight over here is probably not going to go his way. So he's going to send something away, and then hope what's left of Cardlin and Arthur then kill each other to the extent that a unit of pikes and a unit of battered cavalry will be enough to see him over the line. But I think Cardlin did notice him doing that, because there are Minheria sharpshooters following them. And they still have ammunition, so they're going to try and shoot the pike. So Cardlin, seeing what's going on there, good battlefield awareness from the Vengeful One. These Warhammers still doing their thing, still 49 of them. And the Remena Abarim, like, under normal circumstances, the Abarim will be the stronger unit in any melee engagement against infantry, but not this time. Tharbad Warhammers, very, very devastating against them, with those armor-piercing attacks of theirs. In come the Nardukadar once again, getting into the Minhiriath archers. They won't be lasting too much longer. But Cardlan supporting units have already done their thing. The Arthurdain cavalry trying to get around here now, trying to go over to the Cardlan side of things. I think sensing the fact that Cardlan is uh, slowly but surely winning this fight. Arthurdain's infantry is still a little bit a ways from the main engagement at the moment. Actually, the Four Nostra knights they're charging into the Remena Nardukadar. They actually did manage to connect there, but that's risky. That's very, very risky indeed, because if they stay in melee for any length of time with AP spears, those lances are going to fall. Great company as well. They may not be heavily armoured, but of course they'll still do very poorly against the Numenorean spears in melee. Still those Royal Court of House armlets as well. It is interesting to me that Arthane is choosing to charge into areas of the of the field that still have Numenorean presence. The Tharbad Riders, only seven of them left, but trying to do some damage to those Pharazim Swordmasters. Such a difficult unit to kill. I mean, Pharazim Swordmasters going up against the Dunedain Captains. The thing is, obviously, the Dunedain Captains have got so much support around them in those Greenway units and Pikes as well. Going to make a big difference. Starbad Riders taking some damage there, but the charge doing its thing. Still some Remena Bawabram up on this hill as well, trying to do their thing with some more AP arrows. And they're trying to shoot the Tharbad Riders. No, they're going after the Arthurdain Cavalry, interestingly enough. Perhaps punishing them for... I'm sure that Sin at this point was probably thinking, hang on a minute, why are you charging into what's left of my army? Can you not see that Cardlin is ripe for a good charge over here? And honestly, if I were Arthurdain, that's probably what I would be doing as well. Like, there's a big blob over here. Yes, there's pikes. Yes, there's spears. But none of them are pointing the right way to accept a charge. At the very least, you can sort of give Cardlin something to think about over here. The only thing I would say Cardlin's doing wrong here is I would probably peel off a few more men and get them to fully surround this Numenorean front line. For the time being, you're just making Numenor deal a little bit more damage than they otherwise would to your front line. But for the most part, Cardlin's army has done exactly what it needed to. Seafarers of Nindamos routing off. I mean, here the other archers coming to the aid of the sharpshooters. The sharpshooters, of course, those mace men in melee, perfectly capable of defending themselves. Which is again something else which makes the Cardlin crossbows just that little bit extra. Greenway Garrison Spearmen have returned from routing over there. Sin has reformed what remains of his army over here. Although interestingly enough the Minheliath sharpshooters are still trying to chase after them. But it's not going to go too well for them I don't think. Their morale is not going to hold itself together for too much longer I'd wager. I think it's time to go back up to one speed there. Yeah, I'd be amazed if they didn't route here. They're trying to retreat from uh, Naru Na'aru units and Faras and Nobles. They're shaken. The situation is improving, although the Royal Court House of the Rondor is trying to save them here. Sin retreating back through the Minhiriath sharpshooters, doing some more damage. I mean, the Royal Court House of the Rondor, even with the numbers advantage they have, Faras and Nobles are not the sort of fight you want to be sending them into. It would be difficult. Royal Court of House Armley charging in again. He's the second player at this point to have tried his luck at charging cavalry into the Menatar Roman gatekeepers. And he's the second player to have had cavalry killed from it. But here, yeah, Cardlin. All of his units are tired at this point, Cardlin, but he's looking in pretty good shape here. Now, though, he needs to reform his army. To be fair, the Pharisim Swordmasters are still fighting, and he's having to reform his army by going through them, so Sin is still putting up resistance, like the job wasn't fully done from Cardlin, but with Arthurdain bearing down on him, Cardlin does need to reform his army, and it is interesting here, because 
In spite of the fact that Cardlin, it looks as though their army is sort of in far better shape than the Arthedain army across from them. A lot of this is Greenway units. Still a few units of good quality, but mercenary units. Cardlin's morale is always a concern at this late stage in a fight because one big chain route can be a massive issue. So I do feel as though overall, in terms of margins of victory, it's probably fairly similar on both sides actually between Arthedain and, uh, and Cardlin. But of course, there is still the fly in the ointment of Numenor still being on the field with two powerful units so this is still anyone's game because in many ways Sin can be a bit of a kingmaker even if he can't win the get battle himself when he charges in if his cavalry and his pikes don't uh, don't perform well enough to give him the victory whoever he does choose to attack may well end up losing the fight as a result definitely don't want to have to deal with pharaohs and nobles and now and Aru sentinels here in the late game Greenway garrison spearmen are moving across and Again, like, the fact that they still have crossbow ammunition is a concern. Pharazim Swordmasters are over here, and he's going to try and retreat his Pharazim Swordmasters over to the rest of his units, I'm sure, as well, but they're taking damage from crossbows, so I don't think... Yeah, and also Arthurdain. Like, both Arthurdain and Cardlan are having none of it. They're not going to allow Sin to get another elite unit, at least not intact, over to their uh, over to Sin's retreating point. Yeah, they're going to die, crossbows and archers. Sin? Also moving across here, trying to do a little bit more damage to the Wands of the North, but the Wabarim aren't really on the same sort of level as a melee unit to the Wands of the North, even if they're both armor-piercing archers. One is like a bodyguard unit with multiple HP, one is sort of more of a standard upper-end heavy archer. So of course that fight was always only going to go one way. I've always liked this Dunedain look. I've liked the the sort of mix between male, leather, and I like I like the general design of them, especially the Dunedain troll slayers. The concept of just uh, the Dunedain that go out with sort of armed for javelins and axes, sort of designed for felling larger foes like trolls, is kind of a cool one. Appealing. Ones in the north firing in the Royal Court of House of the Rondor, loitering a little bit too long there, and I feel as though if they weren't going to commit to that charge, they never should have come forward anyway. So they're going to bleed a few more unit models for that. And at this late stage in the battle, the Royal Court of House of the Ronda, honestly, are one of those things which could turn the battle in Cardlin's favour. Not if they remain in range of the Wards of the North, though. They need to continue to retreat, because they're still in range. But yeah, still, like, having 16 Royal Court of House of the Ronda, that's a potentially decent charge into... Again, like, are they... They have a few units of quality, but looking at it, yeah, Cardlin, I think they have the edge at this point just because of the kinds of units they've got left, like they've still got a bit of crossbow ammunition, which is always going to be fairly vital. And here the other archers. I think regardless, they're sort of manoeuvring around one another, but this fight is going to end pretty quickly, and unsurprisingly here you can see Sin moving over to this side, and I think he shares my assessment that Cardlin probably have the advantage in this fight going into it, so when he springs forward, it is going to be on to Cardlin, try and claim a bit of vengeance for the defeat he was dealt. I feel as though Sin, maybe his army wasn't ideally suited for facing this kind of Cardlin force. Like, Cardlin spread their wings across a large open plain and also managed to get some good charges off with their cavalry. And that's been a bit of a theme, actually, on both sides of the battlefield today. Units of Lancers managing to land good charges into the centre mass of an opposing front line. That really did tilt the fight in Arthurdain and Cardlin's favour on both sides, and of course, especially with the Tharbad Riders. Like, I feel as though the Fornos Terrain Knights were used slightly more effectively overall. Um, but the Tharbad Riders were able to rack up a similar kind of effectiveness just because the kind of unit they are. Like They've got a crazy charge for the cost of their unit. Of course, it does come at the cost of uh, other things like their morale and such, but uh, still. Menatar Romen Guardians cranking those crossbows into action. What are they going to shoot at as well? It is interesting this, because the Menasar Romain Guardians are actually going to be fairly resilient to this sort of thing, but they're just going to shoot into the front of the Arthurdain Marksmen, not necessarily the worst thing they can do at this point, because Arthurdain's army, normally I would advise against shooting against a unit like this with Menatar Romain Gatekeepers, but because of the numbers that both sides have left, the thing that Cardinal needs to do to secure their victory at this stage will be to you know, narrow the Arthurdain manpower down a substantial amount, although... Ah, Seafarers of Nindamal, 32 of them. Numenor moving forward, so yeah, <laughs> the vengeful one can clearly sense that Sin eventually is going to spring forwards. 
Um, but eventually, look, I think what Cardlin is hoping for here is that he can wear Arthur Dane down enough to the point where there can be no more doubt. More damage being done. But the fact that these marksmen do still have a bit of ammunition is a bit of a saving grace for Arthur Dane as well. It means that they can uh, respond and they don't just have to charge forward into the jaws of a Cardlin army which would be uh, all too happy to receive them. Gatekeepers at this point out of ammunition after their exertions earlier on in the fight. There's still that unit of 24 sharpshooters who have been engaged by the seafarers, so the seafarers sin moving forwards, managing to get into those sharpshooters, and he will be able to destroy them as well, so good play there. Royal Court of House Ronda, and it is going to be Cardolan who makes the move, and to be fair, I mean, Sin's pikes are pretty far away, so I feel as though after them they're going to need to survive a bit of, uh, a bit of pressure here. From a Cardlin advance before they get any help from Numenor, should Sin deign to give it. After all, saving Arthur Dane, the player who essentially continued to charge into Numenor even though Cardlin was winning the fight. What is Arthur Dane going to do here? Arthur Dane's going to try and form up a front line, I think. Still got Warns of the North, that's a strong unit, but overall, in terms of sheer numbers, they're going to try and just run away here, Arthur Dane? Maybe try and buy a little bit more time for Numenor to give some support. And to be fair, Numenor will be able to catch up to these Minheriath sharpshooters. Leaving them behind was a little bit of an oversight from the bench for one. Time will tell whether it proves to be a fatal one. And the pikes are on the way as well. But of course, pikes, even out of formation, are not exactly speed demons. In come the Greenway Garrison Spearmen in force. Tharbad Warhammers moving in as well. Dunedain Captains, a lot of strength over on this side from Cardlin especially. Dunedain Troll Slayers, actually enough to rout those Greenway units. So that is the problem. I mean, Cardlin may be condensing a little bit too much strength over on this side. Their elite units over here, but in the middle of their Greenway units routing immediately in the face of the Dunedain. The Minheliath units showing a little bit more steel in melee. Now with the Menatar Ryan Gatekeepers again, I think the Vengeful One is a little bit guilty of blobbing his troops up unnecessarily. He did that over on that side against Numenor. He was winning, but it was very slow and steady progress. I don't think he's going to have the luxury of that anymore. He needed to get right around and surround Arthur Day more eff effectively than he's done. And he could end up regretting that. It's a lot of men for the Dunedain Troll Slayers to chop their way through, but... Especially if they're going to continue to take charges from the Royal Court of House Thorondor. I mean, Hurdy Sharpshooters getting charged as well, trying to prevent Cardlin from using their remaining support unit. Farazim Nobles taking a charge, but at this point, the Royal Court of House Thorondor have taken enough damage to the point where the Farazim Nobles should be able to beat them, but Sin wants to spend his time charging into units and doing a lot of damage rather than slowly taking away Cav units. Not here. The Arthurdane Pikemen, yeah, over here, of course, Arthurdane are going to lose because this is where the Tharbad Warhammers are at. They still have a pretty healthy number at this point in 32. And there's also the Dunedain Captains. The Warns of the North are a little bit scattered as well, so Cardlin will win this fight, but it's over here I'm a little bit concerned for them. I mean, you'd think just looking at the numbers they'd win, but is the quality there? Those Troll Slayers need to charge into the back and do a lot of damage quickly for Arthurdane, but there's also the small matter of Sin's army. Oh, there goes his general. Getting crushed by a warhammer. No, Iris Anton's moving in. I mean, this is the decisive part of the fight. I don't know. I think, ultimately, I don't think the Vengeful One is going to be punished for blobbing up a little bit too much, I think. I think it was always going to be a bit of a steep mountain for Arthur Dane to climb based on the amount of manpower both sides had left. It's going to be tough here, especially with those raw court running around. Like They're still going to be able to, even as damaged as they are, they're still going to be able to do some damage off the charge. And if things do look a little bit dicey, they should be able to finish them off. The Tharbad Warhammers are still there. Greenway Garrison Footmen returning. I mean, this is a fairly substantial unit to try and deal with. The Naruna Aru Sentinels with 60 still left, but if you're going to win the battle at the end with a unit of pikes, you need to be facing your enemy from one direction only. Unfortunately, I don't think that's going to happen. Over here, to be fair, the Ventral one has also managed to get his crossbows into a really nice position up on the higher ground. Very clear shots he's going to be able to get off with these bolts, and he's going to be shooting at the Narunaru Sentinels. Shields and armour usually make them pretty good at dealing with projectiles, but crossbow bolts are a different kettle of fish to, uh, to standard arrows. And over here in the end, numbers able to uh, carry the day for Cardolan. 
Doodle Dine Captain still alive. Tharbad Warhammer's looking a little bit thin on the ground now, actually. Only eight of them remaining. Yeah, Arthane are actually going to win over here. That's wild. Arthane and Pikeman over here are out in now. Fortunately for Carvelin, they still have plenty of reserves. There's no Iris Sentinels getting in and amongst them in here, the Ash Sharpshooters. They're going to run and instead leave them to the Manatar Romen Gatekeepers. Still some good AP from the Merc Guildsmen. Been a close battle all the way through this. It's been interesting to see. Like, It's been hard to predict who's going to win overall. Uh, but I think with the numbers they have left, I think, you know, it's... It's, it's been one of those battles where... Un Normally, if someone's like clearly winning, I always feel as though there's going to be sort of there's battles I can predict fairly easily as it goes along, where it's like, oh yeah, they're going to win. Like it's it's obvious that they're going to seize the uh, momentum and win. Not really been the case with this one. It's only really been right towards the end where Cardlin has started to pull away with it a little bit more, and it comes down to their you know their spare manpower they had at the end, their numbers, something that perhaps uh, you know the Numenorians, their Numenorian brethren, maybe don't value quite as much their quantity. Uh, but Cardland proving that it's a quality all of its own. And who'd have thought it? Those with the most diluted Numenorian blood end up being the victors. That was the Arthurdain general. The Nairon Iris Sentinels surrounded on all sides by enemy pikes and halberdiers as well. And I think actually Numenor, because the Nairon Iris units are also uh, locked morale and based on the fact that the Dunedain captains... Well, yeah, there goes the pike. So that's going to be Arthurdain gone. Arthur Dane destroyed. So Numenor did technically last longer than Arthur Dane in this fight. Locked morale now in Iris Sentinels, but a well earned victory, I would say, if I carved them. And again, I think for the most part, this comes down to compositions and also sort of map position and how well that the armies they picked suited the battle. And in a wide open field such as the one over here, the engagement that happened over on this side. Cardland's army was very well suited. They had just the right amount of support. You know, they had all of their crossbows and their archers, which did the damage. Their front line was also numerous enough, and it was able to hold the Numenorean quality at arm's length for long enough that their supporting units were able to do the business. And that was key. Because, of course, in terms of pure quality, Cardland wouldn't have been able to defeat any of the other factions in terms of their infantry quality today. But it's all about how you can, how you can account for the enemy team's quality and strengths. And I feel as though the Cardinal composition was very good at that. Uh, Arthur getting the most kills, which not too surprising because, of course, they were able to win earlier on and then they were able to affect the battle that was over on the other side as well. Um, Cardinal, of course, by far and away the um, the biggest army on the field today, which, of course, you know, like I said, quantity of quality all of its own here, as Cardinal do prove. Um, and it also does prove as well that, you know, we saw throughout the battle here that Cardinal did have, you know, their sort of their classic routing issues. But if they are able to manage those things, then it doesn't really affect them as much as I feel as though it. people may say. Like, Cardland are one of those factions that people maybe aren't the biggest fans of because of those morale issues, because it's a very clearly defined weakness. Like, you have a few factions in the game where they have, like, very clearly defined weaknesses, but I feel as though Cardland and their morale is one of the ones which people are most familiar with. But honestly, while it is obviously a problem, like, there's no way you can spin poor morale as being a good thing, it is not as bad as people think. And I feel as though the Vengeful one here, he managed to sort of account for that against a faction which is obviously going to have better morale than Cardinal and is going to be able to hold its nerve better. And he did very well. And ultimately, I think this was a battle where supporting units were the key. For Arthur Dane, that was their cavalry. For Cardinal, it was their crossbows. And again, crossbows... I've, I've spoken enough about crossbows, to be fair. It's more of an issue, I think, with Erebor, but it is still something that with Cardinal it can be a bit of an issue because... I don't feel as though Sin played that poorly today. Like, I don't think he played badly at all, really. But in the end, he was able to—he he lost because, you know, obviously the crossbows got into position, and when that happens, it, it's it's curtains, really. It's it's gonna be it's gonna be very very tough for you to uh, to come back from that. But ultimately, you know, you do still have to get these crossbows into the right position. You still need to use them well to an extent, and the Ventral one did that, and also. You know, he was able to account for the fact that his front line was obviously a far lower quality than the, uh, the Numenorean line he was facing, and he still did very well. He managed to have enough men left over as well to uh, face off against Arthur Dane, and when it called for it in the late game, Ventral was also aggressive in closing down Death Eaters, uh, more uh, battered and bruised army. Um, yeah. Interestingly enough as well, Death Eater probably would have been better off 
you know, focusing down Cardinal a little bit more with his cavalry when he came charging in, rather than taking a few extra chunks off of Numenor. But you know, hindsight is twenty twenty. And then of course there was Umbar, who you know, again Umbar's problem was that they allowed their cavalry to get baited into a fight with the Knights of Numenus and get shot by the Wardens of the North. And also, you know, you know they didn't really have an answer to the Arthurdain cavalry after that, and it was always going to be just a matter of time before Arthurdain was able to use them to good effect. So, uh, so yeah, uh, thank you to Sin. That was a very enjoyable fight indeed. Probably one of the better free rolls I've seen in quite a while, actually, because uh, it was very competitive all the way through. It was nice to have the uh, the Numenorian theme as well. Speaking of which, let's see what did the damage for Numenor. So, a few things getting over 100. The Remena Abarim slicing their way through a lot of the Greenway garrison spearmen, I would assume, on the front line. Obviously, that's easy pickings for them. But there's so many of them, of course, that they weren't going to be able to keep that up uh, over the long haul. Pharaohs and Sword Masters also doing the same, which is even more remarkable when you think about it. They were pretty much on their own against a full pike line backed up by Dunedain captains, and they still got over 135, got over 100 kills, 135 there. But overall, of course, several of these things, like Dunedain Shadowbows, they only got one kill, which uh, is obviously not what you want. They got focused down by enemy skirmishers, and then, of course, got finished off by the Arthurdain cavalry when it came in like a wrecking ball. Uh, but yeah, uh, big, uh, big props to uh, all the players today, because that was a very enjoyable fight, I think neat map as well I have to say like free for alls are always better when the map is more interesting than just a flat green square um, it adds a little bit of spice and you obviously need to uh, account for different things like terrain and maybe Sin also wanted the fight to take place in a more narrow place like this but in the end uh, he sort of was forced into a bit of an engagement with Cardland maybe not the sort of engagement he would have liked but in the end you, know, you have to adapt to a battle like I feel as though you know making a, an adaptable army does help you in this sort of situation um, but yeah very good battle, and uh, hopefully we can see more of this sort of thing, because obviously uh, maps like this are always interesting to see in free for alls because you get to see a little bit more of the map, I feel like, whereas in um, on uh, on some maps like this, where it's like just two teams, you only get to see like one section of the map, whereas in a free for all you get to see uh, multiple areas, which is always quite nice. Um, as for what's next, obviously, I was actually going to do a siege today, but based on my um, schedule for the week, um, it is uh, maybe not quite that easy to do some of the longer ones we'll see um, as a result my next replay after this one will probably be there'll probably be a three day gap between videos after this one comes out rather than the usual two um, because I do have a practical session for my degree which I'm going to have to do um, on a day where I would usually record so I'm not sure whether I'm going to have the time to record another one but we'll see again these things can change so don't really know, um, but hopefully we'll get to uh, another siege battle because I do have a few that I want to get through. Uh, but if not, it will just be another replay, maybe similar to this one where it's uh, sort of uh, a, a newer map that's in a different context. So, um, so yeah, hope you enjoyed this, and I hope you will join me. Whatever is next.